Hello, this is Will Harold, the Energy Hunter, with Akashic Intelligence, the original AI, and Indwell.com. Today is January 4th, 2021, and this is the second video in the series for uh, the Wholeness Architect. And today we're going to discuss some concepts that I think really will provide the groundwork for the esoteric uh, portion of how to search for energy lines in the earth as we become aware of um, how our bodies function with the earth as talked about in the previous video. As I was thinking about the best way to convey the message of the wholeness architect and the esoteric concepts, um, I came across the uh, concept of talking about that, um, you know, as I mentioned in the first video, I'm both a uh, California licensed architect and a California licensed contractor. And that's kind of rare for um, to be a licensed architect and to be a licensed contractor. But I think that these two uh, licenses actually are what afford me the ability to see what a wholeness architect is. And the reason I say that is, is that when you look at what a architect is and what they have to do to be licensed, and again, just to go, if you go to college for architecture does not make you an architect. In the state of California, you need an architectural license to be actually considered and called an architect. And so there's different requirements for an architect and a contractor. You can look at these requirements here and a lot of it's schooling. There's, um, it takes about eight years overall, usually more uh, to actually pass your tests and complete your education and experience requirements. But the big payoff is at the end, now you're licensed to draw stuff. When I say you're licensed to draw stuff, you're licensed to draw plans, you're licensed to design. But this really puts us in more of a head roll where we're thinking a lot, where we're creating, we're designing, we're in those upper resonances of the vibration. And so we are working with our mind and work with our hands a little when we draw, but mostly it's a thought process that we're, that we're working in the very creative process. When you're a contractor, it takes about four years of journeyman experience and you take uh, basically one test, it's about two hours. And after you complete that, now you're licensed to build stuff from plans drawn by architects. So as a contractor, you're really a man more of the earth. You are taking your energy and putting it into physical and manifesting real things in the earth. You're, you know, once you, when you're, if you're a craftsman, you actually have some creativity, but you're usually going off some plan that's been designed or drawn by somebody else. So within this contractor um, architect uh, schema, we have one who is kind of in a high resonance of spirit and one that's in a lower resonant, not that it's worse than being an architect, it's in the lower resonance of the earth. And I guess like within the medical model, this would be kind of like a doctor who would also manufacture his own products. And I know of one doctor like that, Dr. Bear Lando with Alphabetic, where he's a doctor and he also manufactures supplements and other products. So as we discussed, this kind of architect contractor, I'd like to talk a little bit about a archetype that's been around for quite a while. And that is really the archetype of what we call the king priest or uh, king wizard um, for Jungian terms. Uh, and that really started, as far as I know, it probably started earlier, but um, I'd like to discuss the idea of Melchizedek from um, the Bible. And within that story, um, Melchizedek, which is probably about a 2000 year old story, probably was written maybe about 400 AD, maybe, maybe a little sooner. But Melchizedek in the Bible was what we call the king of Salem and also the priest of the most high God. So within this archetype, what an archetype is, is within what Jung said, within the human consciousness, there resides images. 
And these images resonate with all humans because they're part of our DNA and they actually almost like how a, a bird would um, fly south for the winter. They're part of us that as we speak to people, we each have these archetypical images in our mind and we can bring those up and recall those images. So the idea of Melchizedek as king of Salem, which is later Jerusalem, and the priest of the Most High God, which is the, the God of the, the Hebrews in, in the Bible, um, he encompasses both king and priest model. Now, this king and priest model is also later referenced uh, to Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. Um, the book of Hebrews, uh, Paul elaborates quite a bit on how Christ is an example of Melchizedek, both king and priest. And the Bible actually in the Gospels, um, in the genealogy of Christ, goes into great detail to explain how he is a king through the line of Joseph, um, the line of David, and a priest through the line of Mary and the Levitical line, which is the priestly line. So within that archetype, there's been other stories that have um, been developed throughout the ages. Uh, one of the next stories that we're going to talk about is the story of Arthur and Merlin, the story of Camelot, the story of the Grail. Within that story, we also have the archetypical wizard, which is Merlin here shown in blue, and Arthur here shown in a cape. And they're pulling the sword, Excalibur, from the water. And this sword has archetypical meanings also, you know, the sword of truth and so on. And what I'm trying to show here is that we have this idea of the king and warrior. Uh, Arthur is also uh, a warrior and the priest or wizard, which is Merlin's. He's actually a Druid priest. Um, this story was written in the 13th century and it was really at a transition time. It's explaining the transition time as when Christianity was coming into England and the Druids were kind of fading away as the main thought pattern or religion, um, and in, in the story, Arthur is actually a Christian, but Merlin is still a wizard or priest of the old ways, the, the ways of wood and um, nature. And uh, in the movie Excalibur, um, it talks about how uh, those ways are fading and the, the new God, the God of the Christian just coming in. And within that, we can also see that there's two men we have what we call within the Jungian terms, the animus, which is the male side. So it's animus plus animus. And within the Chinese or say Taoist, we would have yang and yang. So there, we have two male characters. So this storyline of the priest, king, king, priest, uh, king, wizard is throughout the ages and it has progressed. And in recent times, it's been also with some very popular movies and themes. And um, one of those is say Lord of the Rings where you have Aragorn and Gandalf, one the king. Aragorn is the king of Minas Tirith and Gandalf is a priest. And this story was written about 1954. Again, we have two men, we have animus, animus, yang and yang. So Gandalf is representing this priest wizard and Aragon is representing the king. As we move forward in time, we have uh, a Lucas story of Star Wars. And within that story, we now have the priest wizard, which is a Jedi Knight, um, who is uh, referred to as a wizard or sorcerer in the current series of the Mandalorian. But they had temples and they had an order and they very much re, uh, represented a priest class, um, but they were also called wizards. Uh, I don't know if they worshiped a certain God. They had the force, but they didn't really have a God, but they did have a structure of, um, of a priestly class. And then next to him, we have his sister Leia, who wasn't a king or a queen, but she was a princess, which represents a royal line. She was, she never became a queen because her planet Alderaan was destroyed, but she would have been a queen. Her mother was a queen, uh, Queen Amidala. So again, we are seeing the archetypes of the priest and the queen now 
and this is in 1977, so 23 years after Aragon, we now have progressed or moved forward into the idea of a, we'd call it animus, which is the male, and anima, which is the female. So now we're combining the Taoist tradition, the yin and the yang. So we have this class um, within the queen goddess wizard archetypes. Now moving forward into say present day, we, you know, this was just made a couple of years ago, we have Frozen 2 with Elsa and Anna. Now within Elsa and Anna, we have two females. So we've gone from male, 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 female, female, female. And within this, at one time, Elsa was both queen and priest or wizard. She was, he's the magical one, but she was also queen. In the most current version, she's given up the title of queen, given that back to Elsa. So again, we have the model of the queen and the wizard or goddess or priest within this model here. So now we have anima, anima, yin, and yin. So these are just some examples of how this king and uh, priest model has been throughout the ages. It's part of our makeup. And it's kind of what we need to become whole. It's, it's how we relate to both spirit and land. There's a story within the Camelot tradition within Arthur where there's a scene where Percival, who is one of the knights of the realm is looking for the Holy Grail because the king is failing and Camelot's in ruin. And so Percival goes and he finds the grail and as he speaks to the grail, he, the grail says to him, what is the mystery of the grail? And Percival says, the king and the land are one. So we have this reference of the king and the land are one. So Percival takes the grail, goes back to Arthur, fills it, Arthur drinks from it, he's restored, and Camelot is restored. So the idea of king, priest, and the king being the land is throughout our history, throughout the human psyche. So as we begin to mold both of these concepts together, we begin to become a wholeness architect. We begin to see the world in a different way. So now we're going to get into something that architects love to do, and that's draw. And so here's a diagram of a drawing of quite a few different aspects of energy and how energy may work and how energy may be understood. And these diagrams are really to show different aspects of some of the books that I talked about in the first video, uh, such as uh, Biological Ionization, uh, Energy of the Tao by um, Mantec Chia. And then some actual diagrams that may help people relate more within a Christian anthrop anthroposophical um, theme. And then I'm going to look at also uh, J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and look a little bit at what, uh, how that may relate to some of these concepts that we've talked about. The first thing that we'd like, I'd like to talk about here is this diagram in the middle. I'm going to zoom in a bit on that diagram so we can actually see it better. And what this is, this is a drawing from the biologic ionization of the human within the um, space of the axes of the vertical axis being the electric. And it's uh, what we would call the alkaline and the negative energy, which is also yang, which is also female. And with this, we get this vortex that comes down and so the alkalinity decreases as we come to this line here, which is the magnetic axis or the line of the land. So up here, we would have the line of spirit, say, higher worlds. Down here, we'd have the line of alkalinity, I mean, of, magne of magnetism, of acidity. So as we come down, we approach this acidic or positive energy or yin or male energy. 
So these two vortexes, one coming from the top, the alkyl energy, the mega to the female, coming up, moving down, the male starting at the, at the ground and moving up to the acidic and positive realm. So in order per uh, biologic ionization to uh, be at what we call homeostasis or the middle path, which actually occurs right here at the midpoint of the human, um, we need to balance the forces of alkalinity and acidity or positive and negative. We have the yin and yang, male, female. So this is what we call the middle point right here, this middle ground. And as we look over here at the, um, this drawing, which comes from Mantek Chia's book, showing these different points. Maybe I can just zoom in a bit more on that also. And I've aligned these drawings so we see that the humans have the same head and feet positions. And this middle point actually runs through the middle of this diagram. And um, so as it runs through the middle of this diagram, we see that we have the Tanti and Chi Chung point, which is right here at the navel, um, which is where creation begins in the, in the human. This is where we're connected by the umbilical cord. Again, it aligns with this midpoint that we've talked about, the, the balance between the positive and negative, the male and female. And that same point corresponds within the uh, spine, which is called the Ming Min. And energy flows in the, yeah, this direction through the organs, from, from the crown, through the chakra of the throat, to the heart, to the solar plexus, to the belly button, to the lower chakras, back around to the tailbone and back up, up the spine, to the cortex and back around. So this is the flow of chi. So we want this chi flowing, but we want to be balanced within this line. And this can be balanced, like I said, we can pick up this balance through diet, within the alkalinity and acidity mix and through the um, use of meditation and other practices. So these are some of the books that we talked about earlier, Biological Ionization, Mantek Chia, um, Awaken Healing Through the Tao. And so as we see these vortexes, one thing I'd like to kind of point out here is it kind of reminds me of the, if anyone remembers this old guy, this is the uh, Tasmanian devil devil from uh, Warner Brothers kind of spun around. It's kind of what we are, these little vortexes that are walking around on the earth and um, have a lot of energy and power. So as we um, look at these diagrams, and now we can kind of begin to relate back to some of the previous discussion that we had on um, the king and priest archetypes. I've put this diagram together, which is a, what we call a Christian anthroposophic model. Um, anthroposophy was also termed um, spiritual science by Rudolf Steiner. Um, and it was came about around the 1900s, about 1940, 1950. And it was a Christian based model, but it also had other aspects that were uh, from Goethe and some of his Faustian models. So let's, let's first look at the Christian model. Some people may be aware of this. Again, I'm not trying to preach here. I'm not trying to convince anybody to be anything. I'm just looking at different, um, what we call schema uh, of how uh, we can arrange some of these ideas or how they've been arranged prior, but how they all fit together within the overall idea of energy and environments and spaces and realms and planes. So if we get back to the diagram here, we have this middle ground, okay? We also have the magnetic axis, which we call the king land axis, okay? This is the land, this is Arthur. This is where the king resides in the land, as we've talked about, okay? This is male, this is acidic, this is positive, okay? Now, then we have this electric axis. This is the electromagnetic field that we have right here, right? We have this electric axis that points up, goes up and it goes down, right? It goes up into the heavens, goes down into the hells, as talked about within the Christian um, theology. So within this, at this top layer within Christianity, we have maybe some people have read about the seraphim, the cherubim, 
the archangels, the angels, and the earth spirits. Now, these all are spiritual beings. They don't have physical bodies. They're outside the, the physical realm. They um, exist in a different plane. So this is the idea that it's where the architect dwells. He dwells in the upper. He dwells higher. His mind's higher. He's a designer. He's creative. He's up here. And then we have the, so, and then within the anthroposophic, um, it's called the Lucifer. It's called Lucifer. Lucifer is a being of light in that um, system. And he's up at the top. There's also other things called thrones and powers that are talked about. So then we have the middle ground. Okay. So within this middle ground, which is here at the uh, Tantian and I mean, men, uh, we have what we call the Christ. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. Um, who is the bridge between the spiritual and men, the, the earth, he, the balance of these two energies and forces. So oftentimes, with, even within Rosicrucian or within the Tao, we talk about the middle way. So this is the middle. This is what we're trying to reach here, this homeostasis, this perfection of being. This is when we dwell within this for biological ionization, we do not degenerate when we're in either up in this realm or too much up in this realm or too much far down in this realm, we actually get into degenerated diseases. So we try to stay in here. We check this by the pH. This is the balance of the pH in the body. So that's what we would say, which is the Christ. It's, it's the middle ground. Again, this is where we'd have Melchizedek that we talked about earlier in that king priest as the kind of starting point that Melchizedek, you know, is said to be a Christophany, a, a pre-incarnation of Christ. In other systems, he's actually, a Christ is a Melchizedek being. There's many beings that are like Melchizedek, but are these incarnations of this king and um, priest on the earth. And then under the Christ, we'd have men. We'd have people like Moses, who was a priest, uh, but he wasn't a king. They didn't have kings until Saul. And after Saul, they had David, King David. He was a man, but he was not a priest. Uh, his prophet or priest was Samuel. And then after that, we have some of the apostles like Peter, who would also be considered in these realms. They weren't Christ. They were in this realm. They were trying to achieve the Christ consciousness, as talked about by Steiner. They were trying to get to this middle ground. And then we have this magnetic axis, which again is the magnetic axis of the land. So when we have under this magnetic axis of the land, we have what we call electricity or technology. Uh, Steiner talks about this as a electri electricity down here and technology. So not the same thing as the electric axis. This is what we call the electricity that runs machines, that runs not our bodies, but runs machines, um, which is an alternating current. Uh, and that's in another whole video in itself, but uh, we can see it as technology. So technology is viewed as a degraded life energy. And it degrades from us. So if you look at 5G, how those microwaves, cellular waves, all these waves that we have, uh, you know, that are detrimental to the human body uh, are down here below this uh, magnetic axis, the axis of the land. And then below that, within the Christian, we have, you know, Satan, the fallen angels, you know, demons, hell. This is the realm of hell, right? This is below the, the, the realm of the land. And with anthroposophy, we'd have Araman, we'd have fallen angels and demons also down here in this, this area. But some people may not say, I don't care about Christianity. I don't want to read that. I don't understand that. So I've kind of actually taken it into actually a Tolkien perspective also, um, because you know a lot of people can relate to that. And a lot of people that is kind of their, their philosophy is that this is really a philosophical system more than a theolo theology like this is. So within this kind of philosophical system, you don't really have a God or a source like we do here. So over here, we'd have the God, the source, or this would be Akashic intelligence over here. Within this system of philosophy, we actually would have ideals. Um, within Tolkien, there's not really a true God. There's not really you know, someone they're praying to or anything like that, but they do have ideals that they live to, which are like courage, hope, kindness, truth, love. And this is uh, shown as when Samwise and Frodo are in Mordor and 
uh, Frodo is being taken over by the ring, and Sam says, you know, remember the Shire, remember, remember these things, remember hope and kindness, and remember the things that make us human that we live for. And so those are kind of the ideals that are up here within this philosophy of Tolkien. And then we have wizards, which is like Gandalf, and, and, and then we have the elves. And, and the elves are not of this world. They are actually going back to the Grey Havens, to their realm. They're only here temporarily. So they're kind of a, a compilation of the seraphim. They also have special gifts. They can talk to trees. They, they talk with spirits. They uh, have wonderful magic. Um, they're up here with the wizard class. They're, they're um, kind of out of this world. Now, if you read the book, you're going to find encounter this um, character called Tom Bombadil, which he is between when Frodo leaves the Shrier and before he gets the prancing pony and when they're in, in the woods and they get captured by a tree. But Tom Bombadil, which is funny that he was left out of the movie altogether. He's, there's one reference of him later on. But he's not affected by the ring. He can touch the ring. He can handle the ring. It does nothing to him. He doesn't disappear. He is almost the same Melchizedekian Christ-like being within the movie. Now, some people say that he's the God. I, I don't see that. I see him more as the Christ figure. But, you know, I'm just, again, this is my opinion. I'm saying that's how I see it. That's how I see him. And, you know, if you really don't want to take the time to read the Bible or read biological ionization or somebody, you might just want to pick up the book, The Lord of the Rings, and see how these things function within this dialectic that we have here. So below Tom Bombadil would be the men, right? The hobbits and dwarves. And the hobbits are a creature that are very much of the earth. They enjoy you know, planting and having fun and they don't wear shoes. You know, they're really of the earth, right? But then we have dwarves who are even more of the earth. I mean, you look at Gimli in this thing and this man's wearing like metal shoes. He's you know, as tall as he is wide, I don't think I could pick the guy up. He is very much of the earth. They're miners, they like money, they're very materialistic, you know, they're just one stage removed from, from the line of, of the axis, the magnetic axis of land. And then below that, what we, you know, there's some discussion about, um, there's a scene where there's a, a talking tree called Treebeard, who's a tree herder, and he's um, railing against a, a wizard who was turned to the dark side called Saruman, and Saruman's cut down his forest, and he burnt all his, these trees and all these friends, and Treebeard saying, you know, this man is of wheels and furnaces and weapons and fire, you know, which then relates back to this idea of electron, electricity and technology. And within the Christian system, there are sects within Christianity who view technology as evil, such as the Amish and the you know, Mennonites. I mean, um, Amish don't even use, you know, cars or electricity. They ride buggies and do everything by hands or with horses, kind of view technology as not as being detrimental to the human race. So within the book of the Lord of the Rings, we have that same sim symbology of the, the wheels and the furnaces being detrimental to humans. And then below that, we have goblins and orcs and uh, Sauron. So orcs are really, from what the book says, are a mating of goblins and elves to create the orcs. And Sauron is a dark lord. So within this, we can kind of see how our typology that we've had um, that make up all people can relate back to these diagrams of these vortexes of the spiritual, the earthly, the middle ground, how the vortexes work and how they work with even within Taoist or acupuncture medicine uh, to create uh, a, um, a, a system that is uh, based on energy and in aspects of the body. So now we're going to get into actually earth energies. I'm sure you guys have waited long enough. And, but I wanted to show how the human, the energies that affect the human and what we may need to do to actually be able to 
um, understand these energies and become in contact and be more aware of these energies that are, that are in the earth. Um, and the first one that we're going to talk about, um, I think we might talk about water veins first here. Because water veins can have a very detrimental effect on the earth. And this is when we have underground rivers. And water in itself is not harmful, but sometimes, sometimes these water veins are. And I've been asked, why do I think the water veins are harmful? And I don't think all water veins are. But when you have multiple water veins or water veins that may cross other geological um, issues in the Earth's crust, like say fault lines or cracks or two or more water lines that may crest. It may be the angle they cross at and that could make them detrimental. But there's been research done on water veins under the Earth, underground rivers or whatever. And they can greatly affect the um, human skeletal system. And they've seen that early symptoms which have been uh, related to exposure is feeling drained in the morning, restless sleep, bad dreams, constant fatigue, lack of energy, headaches, migraines, spinal problems, discomfort in joints, rheumatic problems, and resistance to therapy. How often have we seen people, I have, I don't know if you have, but I've seen a lot of people recently who have a lot of these, some of them say that is, you know, two um, 5G or other waves, you know, can be, but it can also be exposure to this. And it can be heightened by the um, introduction of these other carrier waves of 5G and 4G and 3G, the energy can be heightened and enhanced. This is, it can be transmuted through biogeometry. And we're gonna get into that in some later videos. We're kind of far, we have to have a few more videos before we get to how that's done. We have to actually explain radiesthesia and we have to explain a little bit more. But right now what I'm trying to do is to get you in the spirit, get you into the energy, get you into the flow it's into the idea of the wholeness architect of, that this is not just a task, that it is a combination of the spirit and the land. It must come together in order to really understand the concepts of biogeometry. You know, when you listen to Ibrahim Karim, the uh, inventor of biogeometry, the man's a very spiritual man. He is all about, you know, the spirit the energy of the spirit and the energy that, that we much have this inner work in order to really do a, a good job at biogeometry. So now let's go over here and let's, let's look a little bit at this earth grid that we're gonna talk about. And let's see if I can just zoom in here a little bit more into this Hartman-Curry grid. <clears throat> so, you know, we have what we call the Man Manfred-Curry grid, the Curry grids. And the Curry grid, um, uh, is right here and it runs about four foot, five meters on center. And, um, it's the green line. Uh, see, actually a yellow line, you can't really see it here. And then we have the Hartman grids here. Um, so. A Hartman grid and a Curry grid, the difference mainly is, is that Hartman grids run north, south, and east, west at three meters on center. And the Curry grid runs at a 45 to those um, at 4.5 meters on center. Now, the idea of, you know, where this came from, this really were kind of discovered in the 1950s uh, for the um, Curry grids and same thing in 1954. Uh, Ernst Hartmann was a uh, physician and um, he saw some evidence of cancers in Germany. And he wanted to see if it was a localized issue and maybe what, what, was, what was the environmental issues that may be causing those cancers. And so they, he, he developed, you know, this idea of the Hartmann grid and we have the Curry grid. Now, you know, you know, say how how do these relate to me? You know, should I be worried about these grids like I should the, the water lines, the water veins? Well, the idea is is that these lines are earth energy lines. They can, we need these earth energy lines, I think, to actually charge our bodies. So as we walk across these lines, they charge us. But just as we being, say, a spark plug and these earth energy lines, are charging us 
if that spark becomes too intense, it can burn us out and it can cause these other issues. So what we don't want is say to be spend too much time on an intersection of a Hartman Curry of a Hartman line and a Curry line, right? And these type of area right here, very detrimental to us if we're spending a lot of time there. If we're sleeping on this line, or if we have maybe an office uh, where we're spending, you know, behind a desk and this line is right beneath us, these lines can be very, very harmful over a long period of time unless they're transmuted. That's what we're going to talk about again in biogeometry. So. These are the areas we have to be careful of. So in a home, you really want to be careful of sleeping areas, of areas that you may be sitting for, you know, four to eight hours on. Those are the areas that we want to concentrate on where these lines cross so that we don't get that detrimental energy. Um, you know, like I said, these energies used to, uh, they energize us as we walk across the earth. But one thing that's happened to us is that we've stopped walking barefoot on the earth or with shoes that have leather or natural soles to where we can still ground to these energies so as you know one thing we can do is actually go barefoot more and begin to ground more to the earth i think the one thing that maybe the earth is suffering from and again this is my opinion is that when you look back to the 1900s there were a lot of native peoples and american indians were still in the plains a lot of them we're barefoot or we're moccasin. There's a lot of native peoples throughout South America through um, the Philippines that did not wear shoes or wore very natural shoes or sandals. The one difference is when you watch CNN videos or some news videos or other videos, the one thing I always notice is how these people are always wearing Nikes, right? They're wearing tennis shoes with rubber soles. I don't know how that may be affecting the earth because we're no longer charging the earth. You know, we are now ungrounded to the earth we're almost like a free radical you know like that tasmanian devil just spinning around causing havoc uh, we're no longer grounded and i don't know if that's actually decreasing the earth's energy or not but it could be the other um grids that are within the earth is what we call these this um binker grids and they look kind of like a rubik's cube so they can run uh, vertical to where you look at these Hartman Curry lines, they're on the earth and they have a vertical component, which is that electrical component, which is the negative component. So when we walk on them, we're probably picking up some of the, the magnetic component or, and we're getting that energy. But this electric component that, that rises uh, is what's detrimental to us. But within the, within the Binker grids, they're actually a horizontal grid that is layered. So say if this was the ground, this might be running through your head or you know they're, they're actually they run about uh 10 meters um so this one might I, you probably wouldn't get two binker grids running through you but you at least get one and i've seen these like i say run through um at, at about six feet which would be you know you know four feet in the ground um and that would have to be transmuted because that would always be at your head level or you know four feet if you're, you know if you're sitting if you're uh, shorter but these can be very detrimental and they have to be transmuted within the biogeometry. And we'll talk about that later also. So right now we have the Hartman Curry grids, we have the Binker grid. Uh, we also can show here the, you know, we have ele the electromagnetic field of the earth, which some say is almost like the human biofield with this being the heart. And we have these biofields and we'll talk about that in another video of the biofield and biofield tuning. We have the axis that we've talked about. Um, this is an area right here where um, electricity gets caught and causes the northern lights of the aurora borealis is what we see. Uh, so that's some more of uh, the magnetic field of the earth. Then the other question is, okay, what are ley lines, right? What are ley lines compared to these Hartman Curry energy grid lines? What, what's, what's the big difference between all these uh, certain you know, so-called lines? And Ley lines are really, they connect power spots. And what a power spot is, is that within the earth, there are certain areas that generate a lot of natural power. And, and actually when you um, review a uh, house, you'll find power spots within there. And I, one thing I can say is that those power spots are like that Tasman, they're a vortex. They're almost like the human body on steroids, right? They're huge because they are the earth and they have lots of power generating from them. And a lot of people say the number one power spot right here is in Cairo, Egypt, at the pyramid. 
that the pyramids sit on that power spot and all those power spots are linked to say that, you know, that the, the, the uh, pyramids in um, South America and so on, uh, that these areas are all linked by these power spots. As you can see, there's one goes through here, which I believe is called the, Mar uh, the Michael Mary line, which was um, discovered by Hamish Miller. Uh, he was a very renowned dowser up in England. And he um, mapped this uh, Michael Mary line. But as you can see, they're all over the earth. They all, they, and there's actually some videos that talk about like Angkor Wat, and different temples that were built on these power spots. Um, I think, you know, there's one out in Serbia that uh, is, a, is a, a pyramid. So these are great uh, areas of power within the earth that can be called ley lines. Ley lines can also just be roads. They can be a path um, in which they connect churches, which are not these major power spots, but minor power spots within the earth, Stonehenge and so on that, can, that we have that are uh, a path or a road between those two. I know that behind my house, I have an Indian grinding stone. There's two grinding stones and I have uh, located a ley line uh, between the grinding stones uh, from the Baidu Indian. And um, I, I'll show that later in, in a later video of um, how, how to find that. And the last thing that we're gonna talk about here to wrap this up is, um, you know, kind of, kind of how does this relate to my house or, so this is a Hartman Curry grid overlay that I did for a fellow from a photograph. So it's not as accurate, but I can um, actually uh, locate power lines through remote viewing from photographs. And I, we're gonna talk about that later. We're gonna talk about a lot about photographs and images and um, as above, so below, and how images can translate power and so on. But right now we're just gonna kind of look at this and how this may like look with that Hartman Curry grid. Uh, it doesn't show any of the Binker grid, just the Hartman Curry grid, but it does show power spots. So these little uh, PSs here are the power spot spots also within a home, which um, can generate a vortex. And what you wanna do is you wanna try to take this power, if it's a new house and put um, plastic strands or something and transmute that power throughout the building or if your house is already built, you can put stones and other things on there actually help modify and uh, generate a higher frequency for these power spots. So as we did this for my friend, um, he actually found that in his daughter's bedroom, which I think is up here, had a lot of energy going on through it. So he actually uh, went and transmuted that with some stones that he had and um, got a lot better result. So again, I, I kind of want to show what we're trying to get to here because our next video is going to be on how to use Google Earth to actually show um, some of these lines and create a little project where we can show how these lines run through our house and be able to create a document, a 3D document that um, can translate uh, how the energy lines relate to a home or a property. So let's review a little bit about what we talked about. We start off with our um, What a, you know, what a difference between an architect and a contractor were. And that was kind of getting to this idea of the uh, king priest or uh, king wizard, or we talked a little bit about how that relates to these other archetypes that are being used now in films. And then we related that back to biologic ionization, the Tao, we had a little graph of how that might relate to Christianity and anthroposophy and also to Tolkien. The one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about right here, since we are now reviewing is the Christ, right? The middle ground. Um, within the Bible, it talks about that, you know, Christ was an incarnation of God on earth. And it's interesting that, you know, God chose that family to incarnate into because the head of that family, Joseph, was a carpenter and his son took up that trade. So Christ was a carpenter, like a contractor of the earth. 
but he also was a rabbi. He also was a teacher, so he's also the priest. So it's interesting that if God incarnated in Christ, he chose to be a carpenter. I mean, that's pretty interesting. So with that, we also then talked a little bit about the different energy lines, the Hartman-Curry grid, the Binker grids, the earth magnetic field, water veins, earth ley lines, and how that might relate to a home. So that's the end of this video. I thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Hopefully I've uh, kept you entertained. I know it's kind of uh, long material. The next one may be more exciting, uh, actually showing how to do this in Google Earth. Um, but again, um, this is Will Harold, the energy hunter with Acacia Intelligence, the original AI, and then dwell.com. And I thank you.